Okay, welcome everyone. Technical issues out of the way. Welcome aboard. You're visiting today and participating in our uh, interactive webinar called Business Registration Basics. So happy to see you here and um, glad you could join me today. I'm going to move a little bit here to start with the land acknowledgement. So let's go to the land acknowledgement uh, next. We want to acknowledge that in the province of Alberta, we are situated on the traditional territories of treaties four, six, seven, eight, and 10, ancestral homeland of diverse First Nations groups, Métis and Indigenous people whose ancestors have walked this land since time immemorial and whose histories, languages, and cultures continue to influence our vibrant community. We pay respects to the Indigenous people of this land, past, present, and future, while recognizing their cultural heritage, beliefs, and relationships to the land on which we reside. My name is Linda Griffian. I'm the Education Programs Coordinator with Business Link here in Alberta. Uh, also, I own a corporate registry here in Alberta that services primarily law firms and accounting firms. So for many folks who go to see their lawyers and accountants to register their businesses, a lot of that administrative work and a lot of that filing drops down to my company. And that has happened since 1998. So I'm one of several service providers. I own a company in Alberta that's one of several privatized service providers who provide business registration services across Alberta. I have done that since uh, 1998 when services were privatized in Alberta. So it's already been, gosh, 25 years or more since I've been in the business of doing this kind of business. So you're going to get a, a bit of a, a background today and, and lots of questions answered today. Uh, probably my in my lifetime, I have registered more than 35, 40,000 businesses across Canada. So not just in Alberta, but across Canada as well. Uh, so that's a bit about me. Uh, a little bit more about Business Link. We are Alberta's small business hub. We're a nonprofit funded by the Government of Canada and the Government of Alberta. Business Link has been around since 1996. And we are here to serve aspiring and established small business owners. And we also have some specialties in Indigenous and immigrant services as well. So think of us as the 311 of small business in Alberta. So we do lots of things. We have business advisors. So we have what we call business strategists who man the phone lines and answer your questions. All of this is free of charge services. So they provide one-on-one -on -one coaching and advice. We connect you to resources around the province so that you can be connected with other entrepreneurial resources. Uh, my role is part of the biggest business education piece. We do live webinars, virtual workshops, guides, videos, so on and so forth. And we also provide business support services. So if you're business planning and you're doing those types of things, we have a market research department uh, that does fabulous market research for free. This is stuff you would pay thousands of dollars for if you did it through uh, a private service or through the BDC or something like that. So please take advantage of all the things we do. Uh, along with regular services we provide, we also have Indigenous entrepreneur services and we have immigrant entrepreneur services. So we have a dedicated team uh, that uh, works with each of those uh, types of clients because there are some special niche needs for Indigenous and immigrant entrepreneurs. If you head on over to our uh, website, you can also access the free interactive online business planner. That is a great tool if you're building a business plan for your business and you can log in, set it up, help videos, lots of help and information for that as well. So I'm gonna start, let's get a little bit interactive here. I wanna know from folks in the room, uh, who's in idea stage, who is in startup, who is one to three years. So idea is you've got an idea, but you haven't really pursued it fully yet. Startup is one year or less. Are you one to three years or three plus years? So if you want to drop some of that information into the chat box, 
uh, for sure. Oh, we've got some startup idea stage, startup idea, Ooh, three plus. Okay, so lots of people in idea and startup, and then we have a few in one to three, and we have a few in uh, three and up. I like this one between idea and startup. Okay, so somewhere in the middle of that landscape, everyone's residing. So you're here today for a reason. You're here because you wanna understand what it is to register your business. So we're gonna talk a little bit of, oh, well, we're gonna talk a lot about that today. And I'm going to stop and go and make sure that I capture your questions along the way. So some of the objectives today are understanding what are the types, we're gonna talk about the three most common types of business registration in Alberta. There's lots of types of registration, so we can talk a bit about that, but the three most common. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about how to choose your registration. Um, how licensing works after registration, and what are some of the ongoing upkeep uh, things that you need to do when you register your business in Alberta. So who here watched the business registration uh, video uh, prior to joining uh, today uh, when you signed up in Eventbrite? Okay, we've got some yeses, we've got some yeses. Okay, let's see. I'm going to run it for everyone because it gives us a real quick three and a half, four minute overview of business registration basics. So I'm going to run that for you and we're going to start with that. So let's start with this basic video. And this video is also available in our video section on the Business Link website. So here we go. There are many different types of business structures that you can choose when starting your business. The top three choices are a sole proprietor, a partnership, or a corporation. Before choosing your structure, check with your local government to see if you will require any permits or licenses. Also ask them if it matters which structure you choose. For example, businesses that hire staff may be required to provide them with workers' compensation insurance. In that case, incorporation may be your business's only option. Let's look further into these business structures. Sole proprietorship is completed by an individual who will be the only owner of their business. Choose a business name and register it as a trade name with your local registry. You may find some small businesses in Alberta have the same trade name, and they may even be conducting the same type of business. This is because trade names are not protected. Registering your name allows you to market your business and open a separate bank account for your business. Be careful not to confuse a trade name with a trademark. Trademarks are the most protected type of name. Information about trademarks can be found through the Canadian Intellectual Property Office. Income generated as a sole proprietor is considered personal small business income, and you are taxed at the personal rate. Debts and losses are also personal, and you'll be personally responsible for any liability associated with the business. Many business owners start out with this registration because it is low cost and easy to complete. This is a cost-effective way to start a home-based business, part-time business, or to test your business idea in the marketplace before taking on expensive incorporation costs. A partnership is a non-incorporated business that is created between two or more people. In a partnership, you and your partner's financial resources are combined and put into the business. Both the profits and debts of the business are then shared, according to any legal agreement you have drawn up. When establishing a partnership, you should have a partnership agreement in place. This is important because it establishes the terms of the partnership and can help you avoid future disputes. A partnership is a great business structure to use if you already have an operating business and wish to join with another company or individual who has a complementary business. Joining in partnership allows you both to pool your resources for things like marketing and administration. You can market complementary services to both sets of clients and generate additional business for both companies. You will keep your client lists and business operations independent, but still benefit from one another. There is no name protection for the partnership name. Incorporation means you are creating a new legal entity called a corporation. This corporation conducts business, opens a bank account, and files a tax return in its own name. It is separate from you as an individual. You can choose to incorporate provincially or federally. 
incorporating federally does not grant you the right to conduct business across canada. it simply grants your new company the exclusive rights to use its name across canada. a new corporation will still be required to conduct a second registration called extra provincial registration in any provinces it will be conducting business in. provincial incorporation is a more popular choice. no matter which type you choose, the principles are the same. This type of structure allows you to define roles in the company and separate liability from the shareholders. For the corporation to function, it requires directors to act and speak on its behalf and accept liability and responsibility. Officer titles such as president and CEO are given to the managers of the company. Shareholders are the owners and investors who enjoy the tax benefits of owning shares but are not responsible or liable for operations. Corporate names will end in the legal element of Inc., limited or corp. These names enjoy a modest level of name protection within the province they are registered. You may still find corporations with similar names across Canada. However, companies in your province are not allowed to register identical names. Now that you have chosen and registered your business structure, the next steps will include getting insurance and municipal licensing and ensuring you have your CRA business number. To learn more about what comes next, download our startup checklist. Okay, so this is what we're going to be covering uh, today. We're going to be covering a lot of uh, details about uh, how all of this works. So the reality is when you're registering your business, you are declaring with the government, usually the provincial government, and we'll talk a little bit about federal later, but you're declaring with the provincial government that you are conducting business for profit other on um, using a name other than your own personal name there's lots of different ways to do this so you can uh, create a cooperative you can create a non-profit society you can create a not-for-profit corporation you can create a professional corporation that has certain structures available to it if you're a doctor a chiropractor a lawyer you can create limited partnerships and llps there's lots of those different types of registrations but traditionally and typically and 99.9% .9 of the time, the three most common types of registration will be a sole proprietorship, a partnership, and an incorporation. So for those of you on this uh, webinar, have any of you already registered a type of registration? And if so, do you want to just drop it into the chat box if you've already done some sort of registration with your business in the past? And uh, so we've got number three, Destiny says she's incorporated. We've got a sole proprietor. Anyone here with a partnership? Yeah, we've got corps and we've got sole proprietorships. Partnerships aren't as common and there's lots of reasons for that. So we'll, we'll touch on that. Uh, but we do have one or two. So we'll talk a little bit about that. Okay, so. Let's start with the basics, sole proprietorships and partnerships. So when you register in Alberta as a sole proprietor, what you're doing is you're making a declaration that says, I'm conducting business in a name other than my own personal name. This name does not enjoy name protection. So you and a hundred other people in Alberta can have what's called a trade name and those names can be identical. So if we look in the corporate registry system in Alberta, we see lots of Chinook Consulting, Chinook Consulting, Chinook Consulting. There's probably 50 or 60 of those in Alberta because that's a popular, uh, that's a popular type of registration and a popular name. So it's very important for people to understand that when they're doing this type of registration, uh, no, this is not the same as a nuance search. So we're going to touch on nuance searches and we're going to touch on some nonprofits. But let's start with sole proprietorships and partnerships and how they work. And then we'll stop, pause, and I'll actually drop us into the nuance system. And once we're in the nuance system, I can show you how that system works and how we use it. So we'll, we'll talk about that shortly. So couple things to remember is as a sole proprietor, you are making a declaration. It's a very inexpensive filing you would do at any registry in Alberta. And you would declare that you're operating a name other than your own personal name and that you'd like to set that name aside for your business. When you do that, it allows you to 
open a bank account at your bank by showing them that document. And it also allows you to uh, conduct business under that name and you'll get a little TN number. Right now in Alberta also, we are now connected to the CRA database system, which means when you register a trade name or partnership or corporation or anything else, you'll automatically be assigned the nine digit CRA number. And I wanna be clear, we're gonna cover that later too. The nine digit CRA number is not the GST number. The GST is a piece that you add on later to this number, just like payroll is a piece you would add on later to this number and corporate tax is something you would add on to this number. It's the nine digit CRA number that identifies your business to CRA, just like you have a SIN number, your sole proprietorship, your partnership and your corporation will have a BN, a business number. So think about it that way. And if you want to access other CRA programs or you want to collect GST or you want to have employees on payroll, you would contact CRA with this automatically signed number and you would say, hi, I'd like to connect, uh, collect GST now. I'd like to have payroll now and I would like to add that additional set of components to the number. So that's how you need to think about it. When you're a sole proprietor, you and your business are one and the same. So you will file a personal small business tax return at the end of the year, no matter what name you're marketing yourself under as a sole proprietor, and you'll declare your income as personal small business income and complete all the forms that apply to the income being connected that way. You are also personally personally attached and you and the business there is no separation there so liability falls on you personally everything falls on you personally partnerships work the same way exactly the same way as a sole proprietorship only now it's two or more individuals or two or more companies in business together under a declaration of partnership declaring that you are doing business in a name other than your own personal names. This registration though comes with what's called joint and several liability. That means one partner speaks on behalf of all partners. So if one partner walks into the bank and decides to empty up the bank account, they are fully allowed to do that because they speak on behalf of everyone in the partnership. So you need to be careful with partnership registrations. Most of them end up failing and they are, they're very loosey goosey. So you want to think about having maybe an agreement in place because if you don't have some kind of partnership agreement in place, it's very difficult to determine how are you sharing the income on your tax returns together? How are you doing all of that kind of stuff? together and what are the boundaries and, and that sort of thing for partnerships. So we, in my years of doing this for 25 years, I have maybe registered in Alberta over my lifetime, 30 to 40 partnerships in total. Uh, they're not a particularly common registration and they're not a particularly recommended registration because there's just so much attachment personally in those things. Uh, so I am just going to uh, cover that off quickly and we will cover nuance reports next in the next piece here when we talk about what's in a name. Uh, and we have a question, what is the difference between a nonprofit society and a nonprofit corporation? Nonprofit societies are registered under the Societies Act of Alberta. Nonprofit corporations are registered under the Corporations Act of Alberta. And we're going to talk about those acts and those statutes and how things apply to you. Uh, there are differences. One is set up more like a corporate structure and the other is set up with a, a whole different structure altogether. The reason we don't cover societies and nonprofits in this particular webinar is because they are not a privatized service in Alberta, for one. Secondly, they can be a little complex to set up. You need to have members and you need to establish boundaries and board rules and things like that. And you need to follow some regulations for that. So we don't really cover nonprofits uh, in this particular um, other provinces like Saskatchewan don't allow to our mayor businesses to have the same name. 
Yeah, that's for sure. I do uh, I do registration all across Canada. And depending on your jurisdiction, regulations and rules are different everywhere, specifically for names, primarily for corporate names. And in some provinces like British Columbia and Saskatchewan and Ontario, uh, you're also oh, not in Ontario, but in those provinces, you're required to have a name reservation of some kind. And they have examiners behind the scene looking at those names before you're allowed to register. So some provinces are much more restrictive than others on, on names. And uh, Alberta and Ontario are probably the least restrictive about names. So in Alberta, we have lots and lots of names that are, if they're sole proprietors and partnerships, those names can be identical. And if they're corporations, we have lots of names that are very, very similar, where there's hardly a difference in the name at all. And then there's all kinds of regulations about, well, if a company was struck and is a dead company and it's been dead for a certain period of time, another company can come along and use the name now that it's out of use by someone else. We have lots of those regulations. So I'm going to show you where you find that stuff if you're really into it. And, and how that works and, and the importance of that sort of thing. Uh, so we'll talk about that. So no protection on trade names, no protection on partnership names at all. You can go ahead and register those. That's why when you go to register these uh, names, you don't actually need to have a nuance report. A nuance report is not necessary to register a trade name or a partnership. So just letting you know that. Uh, you'll probably be asked to do it at a registry, but it's actually not a requirement. It's a bit of a, uh, a money grab. Are you considered a partnership if your partner is your spouse? Okay, I'm going to stop the share here. If you are changing business and starting a new, how close can the name be? Is there a cost to a nuance? What is a nuance? Okay. We're getting right into names and I knew we would. So I'm going to stop this share and I'm gonna log us into the Nuance system. So let me just pull that up uh, momentarily. Here, we're just gonna go right into the Nuance system. So stand by, cause I don't, I don't want to share my screen until I've logged in because this is a password protected database. So for everyone who needs to know, Nuance is the Government of Canada's combined search tool of business names and trademarks. This tool has all the names contained in it across Canada that have ever been registered in any way, shape or form. This is a database that is managed and maintained through Industry Canada. You will find uh, names of companies in here, right dating back to the Hudson's Bay registration um, in 18 whatever. So all those names are contained in the system and trademarks are contained in the system. We're gonna talk a bit about the difference between the trade name, which is the sole proprietorship, a registration or a doing business registration and a trademark. So trade names have no protection because you're simply declaring that you're, uh, that you are doing business in a name other than your own. And for whatever reason, the nuanced database is being very uh, finicky today. So let's see if we can get in to do this. Very finicky. While I do that, I'm going to go to the Canadian Intellectual Property Office as well. Okay. Sometimes, because of the size of the Nuance database, it takes us a while to log in. So while I wait for that, I am going to share my screen and show you the Canadian Intellectual Property Office so that you are aware of that information. And I'm going to, there you go. So you're now looking at the website for the Canadian Intellectual Property Office. We're gonna talk about, this is where you would learn all about how to register a trademark, a copyright, and a patent. 
Uh, you can also learn all about trademarks, copyrights, and patents. Trademarks have a high level of name protection, the highest level of name protection. So when you see uh, things like, oh, uh, the little R in a circle under Coca-Cola, things like that. And I've put the uh, link to the intellectual property office into the uh, into the chat for you. When you see those things, that means the company has bothered to spend the time and money, and it's expensive to do it, to register a high level of protection on their brand. So this is when you are branding and you're wanting to protect your brand or you're wanting to license products or services under the brand uh, as well. So let's see if I can. Uh, any questions on trademarks as opposed to uh, trade names and, and that sort of thing? You can type that in. I'm going to check the Q&A. We're waiting to log into the Nuance system. Uh, okay. I have an online business but reside in Alberta. Do I register in Alberta? Okay. I also... Okay, so when you see TM, okay, we have lots of questions, so I'm going to slow this down. Price range to register a trademark is all over the map. If you use a lawyer, it could be, you know, five, six thousand dollars. It takes a couple of years. I did it many, many years ago, and it took me about four years to finally get the trademark. Uh, if you use a trademark patent company, you might get it for about twenty five hundred. It's really dependent on where you go to get it, but I would budget for a trademark. I would budget uh, a few thousand dollars uh, for it, uh, simply because uh, it's going to cost you uh, some money to do it. I wouldn't get too hung up on trademarking. You have to remember that when you register a trademark, um, when you register a trademark, you are going to also have to protect it yourself. So if someone else decides to use it and use it for the same type of business or try to do that sort of thing, it's up to you to sick your lawyers on them to get them to stop. So it doesn't stop people from trying uh, necessarily to, to infringe on your trademark or copyright. It's still up to you to stop them. So uh, that, uh, that's what's going to uh, happen there. All right. Uh, you can learn all about trademarks, copyrights, patents on that website. And this is really something you do as you start to think about branding and you really want to protect things. Maybe you want to build a company where you want to license products and services or you want to uh, set up product lines for things and start to protect those product lines. You can, you can do it for that. But when you're first starting out, it's a huge expense. I would, work, I would worry first about building my brand before trying to spend all the money to protect it. If you're in sort of a business where you have uh, specific manufacturing processes or you need to patent the processes, that is even more expensive. That takes lawyers with engineering backgrounds and all sorts of stuff to muddle through that with you. So um, do a little research. You've got the Intellectual Property Office uh, website and all the information there. Do some research on that stuff. I wouldn't start out with wanting to do that, uh, so for sure. Uh, as for people who are asking about, is registration mandatory for a sole proprietor? If you are operating as you, so Susan Smith, out in the world marketing herself as Susan Smith Consultant, then... No, you don't have to register that anywhere. Typically what happens, so there's actually no requirement to do it, but typically what happens is if you want to open a bank account in the name you're using to market yourself under, the bank wants to see that. So chances are, uh, yeah, you're going to have to do the registration for uh, what's called declaration of trade names. So that's what you'd actually do for that. Um, okay. I have an online business, but reside in Alberta. Do I register in Alberta? Yeah, we'll start to tackle that. I'm a sole proprietor. I've not registered before. 
I have a GST number and remit GST to the CRA annually. I assume next steps are to go to the registry. Will I face? No, you are not going to have. We are not going to have anyone come and judge you if you haven't registered your sole proprietorship as anything. If you're operating right now and no one's asked you to show your declaration of anything, then carry on, carrying on. You can operate under your own name because really you're just declaring that you're operating under an alias. If you went to the bank and they opened a bank account for you and did it under that name, fabulous, good for you. There's, there's, no, there's no drama to sole proprietorship names. Okay, so now I just want to ask, can people see the Nuance dashboard? on the screen. I just want to make sure. Uh, do you uh, see my new on screen that says Government of Canada Nuance Dashboard? Okay, and we're going to share it now. And I'm going to ask you again. Can you see Nuance Dashboard? Yes, yay. Okay, so when we talk about Nuance, this is how you spell it, N-U-A-N-S. It's the Government of Canada website, Nuance. This is where registries like mine and name examiners across the company look when we're trying to figure out whether or not we can register your name for you. We fall under all kinds of laws and regulations in every province to do this. So I'm going to tell you how that works. Let's see if we can find Alberta. To King's printer. So every province has laws and statutes and things that are rules and regulations for all sorts of stuff. Okay, so in Alberta, we have it used to be called Queen's printer, but now we have a king. So it's called Alberta King's printer. Alberta King's printer is the government printing house that publishes the Alberta Gazette and all the online laws for the province of Alberta. So every time we enact a new law or a ministerial order or anything else in Alberta, it gets dropped into our Alberta King's Printer repository. These laws affect you in many, many ways. So we have the cemeteries law, we have the Societies Act, we have the Residential Tenancies Act. We have all of these laws in Alberta that are written as statutes and we fall under, uh, we fall under British common law. All across Canada, every province has this type of repository full of provincial laws. When you are registering your business, you are governed by probably one or two of these provincial laws. In Alberta, if you're registering a trade name or a partnership of any kind, you are governed by the Partnership Act and you are, part, and you are governed by the regulations around the Partnership Act. So if we look under P in Alberta, we have the paint and paint container regulations. We have the parole board remuneration and expense repeal regulations. We have payday loan regulations. And look over here, we have the Partnership Act and we have partnership regulations. So if you're registering a partnership, you are registering and complying with this act and all the regulations that go along with it. Let's take a quick look. And then we're not, I don't want to spend too long on partnerships, though. We really don't want to go there. But just giving you an idea of what that looks like. So if you open the HTML version, it'll say, <clears throat> what does firm mean? What's a body corporate and not a partnership? Uh, power of partner to bind the firm. That means partners can bind each other in contracts, things like that. Everything is contained in here. Uh, trade name, individual using a trade name or ceasing to use a business name. So even trade names fall under here. Okay, so if you're curious about all of this and how it all works, you are welcome to put yourself to sleep at night with the Partnership Act and the regulations. Uh, we also have, and we're going to talk about it, I want to get to corporations very quickly. So we have the Alberta Business Corporations Act. That is the act that governs corporations in Alberta, it governs 
everything, how to hold meetings, how you can name your corporation, what names you can't use, so on and so forth. So that's where you find all of that information about what goes on. So if you want to know more about that, you're welcome to drop in uh, there. The Nuance system is the system we use to find and build names for you. Okay, so what was that name? Uh, Alberta King's printer or Nuance? Deborah, what name are you looking for? What are you trying to ask? Okay. Let's do a free search. Does anyone want to know? Does anyone want to know whether or not their name is available for use in Alberta? You can type the name into chat or you could type it into Q&A. So I'll wait for people. Okay. Yes, the Nuance system is something we subscribe to as service providers. So I've been trained. So we get training on this system. We pay subscription fees. We pay for everything we do here. So today, for example, as a privatized Alberta registry service, which is what I own, I'm able to get into the system. You, as the general public, do not have access to this system. Okay. Let's take a look for a few things. We have Clarity Matters Consultants. Let's try that. I'm just going to type in Clarity Matters because I do these searches millions of times a day. And it says to me, where would I like to search? I can search all of these different jurisdictions and I can also search proposed names and trademarks. I'm just going to select everything. We're going to do a pre-search. Okay. This search is going to tell us what we have found across Canada. So we have an Alberta corporation. That's what the AB means. Alberta corporations have corporate access numbers that start with two zeros. It is an active corporation since 2009. Okay, so we know that this business exists in Alberta. Okay. Moto Art Power Sports. I see someone has put in a brackets a year. Moto Art Power Sports Inc. 2024. You can only use a year in brackets if you are a successor corporation to an existing corporation. There's rules around years in brackets in names. Uh, but if you are not going to be a successor corporation, you can take the year out of brackets and you can put the 2024 uh, without brackets and it has to fall before Inc. So Inc. is the legal designation at the end of the name that tells us whether you are incorporated. So in Canada, we don't have things like LLCs or we don't have LLCs in Canada. So we don't use any terminology related to LLC. That's a limited liability company. Those are American things where you can designate yourself either as a quasi partnership or quasi corporation under all sorts of tax regulations. We don't have those here. A successor corporation, oh my gosh, I don't wanna to go too deep into that. You can contact me later about successor corps and how all of that works. But, but there's all kinds of regulations about successor corps. For today's lesson, <laughs> We're going to stick to the basics. Okay, so we know that you cannot incorporate a company in Alberta called Clarity Matters Consulting Inc. You could also not incorporate a company in Alberta called Clarity Matters Consulting LTD or Clarity Matters Consulting Corp. The legal element at the end of the name does not change it from to make it different enough to incorporate it. So changing only the legal element, which is that designation at the end, does not change it. If you are a trade name or a partnership, you can't use Inc., LTD, or Corp. at the end of your name. That is reserved for corporations. And if you incorporate, you can use corporations spelled in full. You can use limited spelled out in full. And you can use uh, incorporated spelled in, for, in full at the end of your name. Okay, Moto Art Power Sports. I'm just going to search another one. Okay, search for another name. Okay. 
We're going to search everywhere. Nothing there. Moto Art Power Sports. So since we don't already have a corporation called Moto Art Power Sports anywhere, we can't use Moto Art Power Sports year in bracket 2024 because there isn't a pre-existing corporation that is a corporation you would be a successor to. We could use Moto Art Power Sports no brackets 2024 Inc. That's how we would do that. Okay. I'm going to do just a search to show you Chinook Consulting. We're going to look at that because that one shows up in all kinds of forms and this will tell you what we mean when we talk about name protections and all of those sorts of things. Okay, Chinook Consulting. Here we are. When we look for Chinook Consulting, you can see that there's pages and pages and pages and pages of Chinook Consultings in here. Is it expensive? You cannot get access to a Nuance account like this unless you are a registry agent or you're part of the provider system. Uh, it's You have to have bulk name search access to this system. So it's not it's charged per hours, but you need to take the training and take the courses and do all of that to access a nuance system. In many provinces, for example, like British Columbia, Saskatchewan, New Brunswick, a few others, you order the reports, but someone else examines them or you don't order them at all. And the examiners in those provinces, you just submit your request and they work on the back end of the system. This is a back end system you're all looking at that no, you do not have access to. I'm granting you viewing so that we can talk about names today and what we would see in the system. So if you see TN in front of a number, that means it's a trade name. If you see a 20 in front of a number, it means it's an Alberta corporation. And if you see AB, you know it's in Alberta. So lots and lots of Chinooks in Alberta. But you can also see that there's some in Saskatchewan. You can also see the status of the company. Oh, it's inactive or it's been struck off. Uh, we see a BC company that's active called Chinook Consulting LTD. So here's a couple of things to understand. Just because you register your company in one province doesn't mean the name is available to you in another province. We have millions of names across Canada. If someone else in British Columbia has your name and you have your name in Alberta, then if you choose to register your Alberta company into that province, you will have to take on what's called an alias because you won't be allowed to use your name in that province. So you'll be Chinook Consulting LTD uh, operating as a different name in that province. Okay. Do we need to go through a third party to do a nuance search? Okay. Yes and no. If you are registering a business in Alberta, and whether it's incorporated or you want to check as a sole proprietor, whatever, yes, you go through a third party registry agent or someone like myself or whomever to get the nuance report. I don't want you folks to be hung up on nuance. Nuance is just a way for us to search to see if your name's available or not for registration purposes. Uh, it's a five minute check for us to do that in, and, and we don't want you thinking that this has to be something you access. If you want to federally incorporate your federal Canada corporation, you have limited access to the Nuance system, which means you're going to punch in your name and they're going to let you know whether it's available or not, and they're doing that based on the Nuance system. So please don't get hung up on the Nuance system. This is a costly database blah, blah, that is a back-end database, just like lots of market research databases are back-end databases. What you need to know is that your service providers are using this system because everyone, every jurisdiction in Canada reports into this system so that we can pre-screen names and understand whether or not they're available to you to use based on what we know about the Partnership Act or the Corporation Act or the acts in all of these jurisdictions which set out what you can and can't use as a name. 
Okay. If you are running, so I'm gonna just sort of pause the share because we're back at Queen's Printer. If you are concerned about your name, you can reach out to me. I'm Linda at businesslink.ca and you can chat with me about name reservation. I don't want to spend the whole uh, session here talking just about name reservations. We use this system to help us understand whether or not the name you are choosing for your business is a reservable and registerable name in Alberta. When we get to corporations, when we get to that part, we're going to talk a little bit about that. Uh, okay, so everyone, if you want to reach out to me and just have a little gab about names, I could keep you on the line all day. And I'm going to just type in my direct number into chat as well. Uh, and if I don't answer the phone or whatever, please leave me a voicemail, reference this particular webinar, and I can call you back as long as you let me know what number to reach at. So I'm going to do that, trusting that, um, that we'll be talking about names and registrations and things like that on those calls. Okay, so I'll do that. Any kind of business you are conducting for profit is you either conducting that business as a sole proprietor by yourself and registering a trade name or in partnership with other people for profit as a partnership, or you've decided you want to create a separate person, separate and apart from you, on paper, called a corporation under the Corporations Act of Alberta or the Canada Business Corporations Act as a federal corporation. So I'm gonna stop here and we're gonna start to talk about incorporation. Let's just go there. I'm going to do a new share, get back to my slides. Okay, can everyone see my PowerPoint again? It says incorporation on it. Just want to make sure we're all in the same. Good. Okay, so a few things you need to know. When you, we've talked about sole proprietorships, partnerships, how the business is not separate from you. You personally are all engaged in it and it's a personal urine tax filing of personal small business taxes done. The registration itself is a simple declaration you can do at any, any place you want to go for it. And it takes about 20 minutes to do a declaration of partnership or, or trading and my office, we do it in five minutes and under. It's a very simple, inexpensive declaration. A couple things to know in Alberta is corporate registry fees are uncapped government service fees. So in Alberta, when you go to renew your driver's license or you go to do personal property items or you do those things, the fees you pay are set and capped so that you are consistently all across the board paying identical fees for everything. When you are incorporating your business or registering your sole proprietorship or partnership, the government fees are stable and consistent. So what the government charges is consistent, but the, the service provider fees are uncapped, which means all of us can charge whatever fee we want for those services because the government hasn't told us we need to cap the amount we charge for those fees. That's why when you're thinking about registering your business in Alberta, you're going to get quoted all kinds of different stuff from different people for different reasons. So if you're going to a law firm or an accounting firm to get your registration done, you're being quoted their fee because they're going to be paying an agent or paying uh, a registry or whoever else to do that work for them behind the scenes. And they're going to be advising you. So you're paying their advisory fees, which is why you would pay more at a law firm or an accounting firm to get registrations than you would if you went stood in line 
at a registry. If you went to a service provider like myself, we would charge you somewhere in the middle because we have direct access to the system, but uh, a company like mine wouldn't make you come in and stand in line. We would do all of that stuff over the phone and we would figure it all out for you and we wouldn't make you fill out kits or forms or anything else. We would just get it done. So we would charge for the convenience and the consistency of that service. If you walked into a registry, some registries may charge you more, some may charge you less. It's all over the map. So just letting you know that's why you're seeing the fees the way you see them. Okay. When you incorporate a company, you are creating a separate person, separate and apart from you. This person exists on paper. So you get a certificate of incorporation, you get articles of incorporation, you get a registration statement. Once this person is created, it comes into existence. Only once the button is pressed and the certificate of incorporation is generated, do you have a functional incorporation that can now go out into the world and open a bank account and get municipal licenses and do all of those things. If you have an existing trade name and you're operating as a sole proprietor and you decide you now wish to incorporate because maybe there's tax benefits or maybe you're in a situation where you might be signing commercial leases or having people working for you or out on job sites where there might be liability associated with the work that you do and now is the time to do it, you are not taking that existing trade name and turning it into a corporation. You are leaving that trade name behind and you are creating a brand new person that gets its own name, does everything in its own name and starts from scratch. Okay, you're not transferring from one thing to another. You are stopping one thing and creating something brand new. I just need people to understand that. If you move from Alberta with a trade name and you decide you wanna live in British Columbia, you don't take the trade name with you. It's a provincial registration. You get to British Columbia, you've moved there. And since the trade name is attached to you, you have to register a brand new trade name for yourself in British Columbia. It's not a transferable thing, okay? A corporation, think of it like having a baby. Once you have this baby, it has needs and it's brand new and you're giving birth to it with a certificate of incorporation. You can choose two types of babies in Canada. You can have a federal Canadian corporation or you can have a provincial corporation in the jurisdiction in which you live and reside and do business. Many, many people think that if they incorporate a federal corporation, oh, it just gives me the right to do business all across Canada. That is not true. Every province in which you wish to conduct business with that federal corporation is going to ask you to register that federal corporation extra provincially into the province. So if you live in Alberta and you decide you want a federal corporation, you're still going to have to take that federal corporation, which is the brand new baby, and you're going to have to register it with the province of Alberta to say, oh, I want to take this baby and do business in Alberta. And then we would generate an extra provincial registration for you in Alberta. So there's actually two registrations involved there. What a federal corporation does for you is it gives your company its name protection across Canada so that when it goes to conduct business across Canada, it doesn't have to keep doing a nuanced search in each jurisdiction to get the name there. It's considered protected Canada-wide. Federal company names are very difficult to get because the nuance is submitted to an examiner and examiners will say yes or no to the name. And the name regulations federally are very strict so uh, federal name regulations, which are very strict, often will say, no, nope, this name is not available to you. If they even sniff a name similar to yours anywhere in Canada, they're not going to let you have that name. If you are offering services virtually, like I've done, I'm a virtual company. I've offered services virtually since 1998. I have an Alberta corporation for my company. We are Alberta corporation. I do business all around the world with my Alberta corporation. So it doesn't matter. 
Okay. So if you have a federal corporation, you'll be required to extra provincially register in the province in which you're living in your registered offices, et cetera, et cetera. If you have a provincial corporation, you have the right to use that name in the province of choice. Lots of jurisdictions have uh, restrictions on who can be directors and shareholders and things like that. Federal is more strict than Alberta. Alberta is very loosey-goosey about who can be directors, who can be shareholders. We'll talk about that quickly. So typically, 90% of the work we do is provincial and corporation all across Canada in the provinces of choice to answer people's questions on that. Uh, if you run a business in Alberta, but buy products or transfer from Ontario to sell in Alberta, you still have to do this. Do what? Register your business. You have to register your business in your place of residence in some way, shape or form. Or if you don't reside in that place, you have to appoint an agent for service if you're a corporation, if you create a corporation in that jurisdiction. So, for example, we have lots of people who live in Ontario who like to invest in property in Alberta. And in order to invest in property in Alberta and have it in your company, so your corporation has the land title, they register an Alberta corporation because under the Land Titles Act, you need to be in Alberta. So Alberta corporation is an Alberta resident. So they create an Alberta corporation. They use an office like mine for agent for service, but the directors and shareholders and everybody is from somewhere else. That's fine. But the company itself has to have a physical address, not a mailbox, a physical address. So whatever province you're in, You'll, your corporation needs to have a physical address in that province. It needs to have someone accepting service of legal documents and a registered records office in that province. And it, in many cases, in some provinces, you may or may not have to reside in the province to be a director or not. So we're, I don't want to go too deep there. Again, you can talk to me about those things sort of offline. Uh, if for example, I buy products and services from around the world and I sell my products and services around the world, but I sell to everyone as an Alberta resident corporation, charging Alberta taxes where necessary, GST, et cetera, et cetera. Depending on what you are doing and what you are selling and how you're doing it, you may need to register your business in other provinces. In Alberta and in Western Canada, we have something called the Northwest Partnership Free Trade Agreement between BC, Alberta, Saskatchewan, and Manitoba, which is supposed to be designed to make doing business with these four provinces together easier. And one of the things that happens under that agreement is that if you're an Alberta corporation, you can register and waive the government fees for it. You can register your Alberta company in BC, in Saskatchewan, in Manitoba, and not pay government fees for that and not have to file the annual renewals in those provinces for your company to have um, physical presence in those provinces. Uh, that's not true if you're a federal corporation. Each of those provinces is going to charge you for that. Uh, So if I do business all over the country or world, I just need to have a registration in the province in which I reside. Technically, yes, but there's all sorts of gray areas to this stuff. <laughs> so for example, if you have an Alberta corporation, but you wish to set up, say a physical location in British Columbia, you wish to have staff there, you wish to purchase property there, you wish to sign leases there, you wish to do things physically and, and have a physical presence there, you'll be extra provincially registering your Alberta corporation into that province. The same would apply to you if you were a Canada corporation, you would extra provincially register your federal corporation into that province. Okay, so always check. So if you think, oh, uh, you know, if you're, if you're setting up your Shopify store, that's what you're doing, or you're doing, you know, drop shipping and things like that through Shopify or Amazon, just get yourself registered in your jurisdiction in which you reside and pay taxes in and do your daily life in. And that should be sufficient to operate there because those types of operations take care of all of the other logistics for you. Uh, 
so as long as they know you have a business number, a CRA number, and some type of registration where you reside and with what you do, okay, you're good to go. Free to register in the, if you register in, in good standing as a corporation. Russell, yes, it is free. It's not free, Russell, to register in the other provinces if you're using an intermediary to help you with that, but it is a waived government fee. So the government, if you are an Alberta corporation and you wish to register in BC as an extra provincial company, Saskatchewan as an extra provincial company, and Manitoba as an extra provincial company, the government fees are waived for that. You may, you will have to pay for the name reservation fees in those places. That's not waived for you, but you won't have to pay government registration fees and you won't have to pay annual company renewal fees to keep your company alive in those provinces. Okay, I'm gonna pause, check some. I think we've answered primarily residing in Alberta and doing online business. So we'll mark that one off. Can a corporation have a sub-brand like Alphabet as parent company of Google, for example? If so, what considerations need to be made? So just like you as a person can register a trade name to yourself, your corporation can have a trade name. You can have multiple trade names. You can have 10 trade names, as many trade names as you like. Your corporation is a person too, and your corporation can register as many trade names as it likes to itself. It can only have one corporate name, but it can have multiple trade names. I have a corporation and I have multiple trade names registered to it. I walk into the bank and I say, please accept checks and everything else under all of these different trade names to my corporate bank account. And we account for all of that income as corporate business income to the corporation because the trade names belong to the corporation. And we just mark it a variety of different services under a variety of different trade names, but ultimately it all falls under the corporate umbrella. And if you want to have uh, the parent company and holding companies and things like that, other companies can be shareholders in other companies. So that's how you get the term holding company and main company and parent company is when one company is created to hold shares in another company. So Kelly, I hope I answered that question. If a business name is already existing and I like to start my own incorporation, but with the same name, could I add the 2024 to it to make a different? Depends where you wanna go with it or what you wanna do. So when we looked at Moto Art Power Sports, no one else seemed to have it registered anywhere in Canada. We actually looked at that in the Nuance system. No one else has it registered. You have to remember that domain names are different. There is a wild west of domain names. So just because a name is available for you to incorporate doesn't mean someone else doesn't already have the domain name. Those things are not attached together. So one of the things I tell people a lot is don't get super hung up on your corporate name. Back to Google and Alphabet and back to if you're old like me, back to BlackBerry. Everyone knew what a BlackBerry was at some given point in time. None of us knew what the parent company name of the company who owned that brand was, uh, or only a few of us did who were like techie nerds or whatever. So even though the company name was Research in Motion Inc., none of us cared what the company was called. We all knew the name BlackBerry because that was what was associated with the company was the brand of whatever product or service it had. So don't get super hung up on your corporate name. There's millions of them across Canada. There's millions and billions of them across the world. Chances that you've got something unique that no one else has is kind of slim. Worry about your own jurisdiction. And in your own jurisdiction like Alberta, putting 2024 in the name would actually be enough to make the name different. Changing the legal element does not, but putting in something else as a distinctive descriptive element in there does make it different enough for us to register it. We cannot register identical names and a few other things we can't do with names. That being said, if a company exists 
and has existed before you with a very, very similar name, and they don't like the fact that you're using a very, very similar name, they can go and make a complaint to corporate registry, which is up in it, which is the government service, Alberta corporate registry. They can send you a letter saying you are marketing and you are doing stuff under a name that is very similar to ours. We don't like it. You're making your website and your Facebook page and everything else look just like us. And you're trying to copy us and we don't like it. And we've looked and done a search in corporate registry and noticed that your name is very similar to ours. We would like you to stop using the name. And if you don't do it, we're going to ask corporate registry to make a ruling about the name. So be aware that even though we can register similar names in Alberta, if you're starting to really market and take business away from someone who's already got a very similar name and they're kind of feeling prickly about it, they can start a process to ask you to change your name. And corporate registry will choose to rule in your favor or not. It's totally random and up to them. It doesn't happen often, but I have twice in my career in the last 25 years changed a company name because someone else didn't like it, even though it was different enough from the other company that we were fully able to register it. So be kind of aware of that, that you want to be done. Okay, I think I made a big mistake registering an incorporation for two different brands that I have. I wanted the sub brands to be under the umbrella corporation. Can I rectify it or leave it as is? Well, the first thing you wanna do when you have done something like created bunches of corporations is get into your accountant, chat about what it looks like from a tax perspective and what you've done and decide whether or not you want to, whether or not you should just dissolve a corporation and file those tax returns and just keep one and do something different, whether you should keep them all or whether you should take all of them and amalgamate them into one through a process called amalgamation. We're not going to talk about amalgamation today, but destiny, that's a conversation you need to have with your accountant. You need to say, look, I'm, I'm paying for all of these companies to file returns every year and do things. Is this really making sense? It, can I amalgamate them? What does that mean? Do I need to get rid of one? What should I do? Should I keep them? That's a tax conversation to have. Okay, so we're done there. I've answered as many as I can live. I think provincial needs a corporate annual return goes to corporate structure and not the profits. Okay. When you register a trade name or partnership in Alberta, that registration lives on forever. We're one of the few provinces where you don't have to renew that registration every so many years. In other provinces, you may every five or six years have to renew that registration. In Alberta, those live on forever until you choose to walk in and dissolve it at some point in time. In Alberta and in most other provinces and every other province, you pay to keep the status of your company active every year. So in Alberta, the government fee on that is a $50 government fee to keep your company's status as active. And any registry will file it for you. And then all of us will charge you some variation of a service fee to do that for you. Um, can Business Link help with starting? An, okay, so Business Link itself will not help you start businesses. That's the, from a registration standpoint, we're not gonna help you register your business. The private registry system in Alberta is going to do that for you. And some may be more helpful than others. If you want to talk to me about how my system's helpful, you've got my email and my direct line for that. The business link itself is just going to do stuff like this. We're going to talk to you about what it all is and kind of prepare you so you know what you have to walk into. Uh, nonprofits, I don't know why people are very keen on starting nonprofits right now. My first 20 years in business, no one wanted to start a nonprofit. Now everyone seems to want to start a nonprofit. And I don't know why. They fail miserably. They are maintenance and headaches to maintain. You have to keep boards of directors. You have to file annual returns every year for them with audited financials. They are cumbersome and administratively heavy. Uh, it's a lot of work to maintain them. Uh, for most nonprofits, you also are setting it up so that you've got many people involved who are members of the board of director and you start to lose control. If it's a nonprofit you're passionate about and you've set the darn thing up, you could be 
out of it within a year or two because you've just been kicked off the board by other board members, all of that kind of stuff. If you want to start a nonprofit, I highly recommend sitting down with a lawyer and I can recommend a good nonprofit lawyer to you. Not all of them do it. Not many of them want to tackle it, but I have a list of two or three who can help you with that because you need to set up your articles to, if you want to obtain charitable status, all of those things. And it's very onerous. So think of a little bit about being a nonprofit. And I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to, um, uh, send everybody in the email follow-up. I'm going to send you a whole bunch of links and resources for nonprofit as well, because uh, there's a lot of questions about it. Uh, not So Michelle, not-for-profits, societies, and corporations all have to file annual returns each year uh, to stay active in the government system. In Alberta, not-for-profit societies, cooperatives, all of those types of registrations are a direct-to-government service. They are not privatized as part of the privatized registry system here in Alberta. So the most a private service provider would probably do for you is direct you to the government Alberta website and do the nuance report. That piece we can do for you. Everything else you're doing on your own. And I highly recommend spending a bit of money with a small boutique law firm to get it done right uh, for not-for-profits. So we'll consider those done. Annual return under the Business Corporations Act. Okay. So we're gonna talk about record book maintenance and annual returns in a bit, Michelle. But every province wants you to renew your corporation every year as a basic filing to report in information like address information, director information. Uh, Alberta is one of the few provinces left that asks for voting shareholder information as part of that reporting. But it's simple, easy to do filing every year based on the birthday of your company. It's not the same as a tax return. So tax returns and annual returns for corporations are different corporation can choose its financial year end. So you as a taxpayer, your financial year end every year is December 31st, and then you have till some point in the spring to file your tax return from that year. Corporations get to choose their own fiscal financial year end and file their tax returns based on that. And corporations are taxed at a completely different rate than people are. So you can do that separately with the corporation. Your corporation every year has to file to renew its registration in the corporate registry database. It's confusing because it's also called, it's called an annual return. So many people think it's the same as a tax return. It is not. It is a simple renewal of here's the voting shareholders. Here's our current address information. We plop that into the system and it keeps the status of the company active for another year and it's based on the birthday of the company. So if your company was born in October, it's due every year in October. So that's how that works for corporations in Alberta. Okay. Okay, so Kyle, you may have missed it, but can you spend a little time on Alberta LTD numbers? So if you choose not to have a name for your corporation in Alberta, you can have a numbered company. It can end in Inc, LTD, or Corp, and it will be 1234567 Alberta LTD. You don't get to choose the number. It just defaults to the next number in the system. When we incorporate it, that's the number you get. That numbered company, there's nothing wrong with having a numbered company. Lots of people will do it for lots of different reasons. Some people have a numbered company without a name because they're not marketing anything. They're just holding maybe some assets or some real estate in it. And it's just simpler to have a numbered company, not try to think up a name. Other people have it because they don't know yet they want as a name for their corporation. And you're always welcome to change your corporate name by doing a filing called Articles of Amendment. So we do that all the time, change company names. But your company will only ever have one corporate name attached to it. If you want to operate as other things, so for example, my corporation is called Small Business Resource Centers, Inc. No one knows what that is. That's just the corporate name. But I have a number of trade names that are registered to it. So my corporation made declarations of trade names for, you know, the incorporators, corporate legals, a few other names that we have. Those names have no name protection on them. They don't end in Inc, LTD, or Corp. It's the same 
thing that you would do if you were a sole proprietor making a declaration, only now that name is being declared by your corporation and you get that piece of paper for that. You walk into your bank and you say, here's the 10 declarations of trade name I did. Just be sure to accept money under those names, but it all falls into the corporation. And when you go out and market to the world, you can have pamphlets and cards and Facebook ads and everything under those trade names. But the revenue you take in falls to the corporation because the corporation is the one that owns those trade names and has the bank account and collects it all. So hopefully, Kyle, that answered that. Other companies like Google and Alphabet and Meta and Facebook, well, they'll have hundreds and hundreds of corporations set up in all sorts of great ways all around the world in tax havens of their choices to accommodate what they want to accommodate. And they may have one company set up somewhere called Alphabet or Meta, or even maybe not. They may just have done it as a trademark and it's it belongs to their corporations. So there are so many hundreds of ways to do those things. Okay. I wanna to get to the people involved in the corporations because that's important. Um, and I'm just gonna check in on chat as well. Peter, just checking in on chat. If you registered a trade name in 2007, even if I don't collect GST, So your CRA business number, that nine digit number is not, I repeat, not a GST number. The CRA business number is the CRA business number is the CRA business number. It's the nine digit number, just like you have a SIN number for you, which is your personal SIN number of nine digits. It identifies your company to CRA, whether it's a trade name or not, so that when you're reporting in your taxes and everything else every year, it attaches to that. There's lots of different ways a business number is also used with the government of Canada, and that's going to expand over the next few years. If you wish to collect GST, if you wish to import export, if you wish to have payroll, and uh, if you're a corporation, if you wish to file your corporate tax return for corporate taxes, you're going to get more designations behind that number. You'll get an RP, an RC, an RT, and I don't know what it is for import export, RD maybe. And it's gonna be 0001 at the end and it attaches to your nine digit business number and identifies the fact that you have chosen to register to collect GST or that you have chosen to register to uh, remit payroll remittances for employees or that you have chosen to register to import and export, okay? If you are in business and you're not collecting GST and you ever, ever hope in the world to grow your business to a point where it becomes big and supports you and gets bigger, I highly recommend getting used to collecting it and charging it on your invoices and registering for it, whether you're a sole proprietor or not, because customers know to expect it. If you're going to grow your business and you have to start charging it eventually, you've got to be prepared administratively for it and you have to price yourself accordingly. Yeah, you have to price for the cost of administering the fact that you're collecting taxes on behalf of the government. So just from an entrepreneurial standpoint, from a business facing marketing in the world standpoint, I never have understood why people don't register to collect the GST right away and get used to the fact that if you're going to grow a big business and have good revenues in your company, you're going to have to do it at some point in time. You may as well start sooner rather than later. And you can also, if you're collecting it, you can also subtract from it all of the GST you pay on your business expenses and just remit the difference. So I've never understood why people don't do it and just get used to it and understand that their clients and their customers know that already. If you're a small business, you can't compete on price anyway. It's, it's futile. Compete on something else. So that's my stuff. Vendor. Okay. Topeka, if you are a vendor, it means you are setting up shop and selling something. That's what a vendor does. You don't have to do anything for that. You can stand in 
the farmer's market is you yourself with a vendor license from your municipal jurisdiction and go at it, but the license will just be in your personal name. Uh, and your returns, will there be recording? Yes, there's a recording for this session. And Mystic Mountain, yes, you get a notice by email now from the government of Alberta if your email address is in the system to file your annual return. But if you fail to file your annual renewals for your corporation two years in a row, a strike off procedure begins for your corporation and you are automatically struck from the system. That means your company goes from living to dead. <laughs> Off with your head. The corporation is now a dead company. And when you go to file your tax returns, CRA knows that you're a dead company and sends a letter back going, we can't process any of this because your corporation is dead. Uh, you have to do something called revival. So when you revive your corporation, it revives as though it's never been struck and you have only a certain period of time to do that. So it used to be seven years, now it's 10 years. And if you don't revive it, then you can't file those tax returns and revival is an expensive procedure. We charge people a lot for revival at my office and you can't write a letter to Alberta Registry saying, I never got the notice. I was supposed to file my annual return. They don't care. The directors are responsible for it, whether you get the notice or not, it's your responsibility. When you register currently a trade name in Alberta since 2021, you are automatically given the CRA business number, nine digit number, it's automatically applied. That was new in 2021. Prior to that, it did not happen, but now those two databases are connected together. So whenever we register any kind of registration in Alberta, whether it's a trade name, a partnership, an LLP, or anything else, the business number from CRA is electronically, automatically assigned. Those databases are connected. Does the 30000 amount income register for GT? Justina, you need to talk to your bookkeeper because that's a rolling 12-month period, not an annual 12-month period. And they'll talk to you about what happens when you hit that threshold in a rolling 12-month period of time. And that's an accounting question. Grants for startups, that is a totally different presentation, Tamara. So grants for startups, you can Google that and uh, the Canada.ca website has a whole way to uh, help you work with that. Do you include GST? Okay, I'm not gonna answer GST tax questions or corporate tax questions or personal tax questions. Questions about taxation once you've got your numbers and your registration in place, fall into the purvey of bookkeepers and accountants. The first bit of outsourcing you should do with your company, whether you're a sole proprietor, a partnership, or a corporation, is ensuring that you are pricing your services and your products and everything you do in a way that allows you to pay a bookkeeper and an accountant to help you manage the financial piece of the business. That is the core piece of the business. So you want to learn what it's all about, but you want someone else there managing it for you so that you can go out and make sales and do other things. So I'm going to just make that statement, put it to the side and say, those are questions. We also have a business link right now, the CPA series. That is underway where we have CPAs delivering almost every week right now. Uh, anything you wanted to know about these types of registrations and everything else. And if you go to the Business Link website and look at our last two recorded webinars from that series, we've got lots of answers about GST and things like that. There is no difference between LTD and Inc. at the end of a corporate name. Inc. LTD Corp all mean you're incorporated. It's the legal designation that shows that the company you are doing business with is incorporated. Inc. LTD Corp mean incorporated corporation limited. Those all mean the same thing in Alberta and in Canada. Those are the three legal elements that mean you're incorporated. And you cannot use those legal elements if you're a sole proprietor. So don't go registering a trade name and call yourself, you know, ABC Consulting LTD and all you've done is a trade name or partnership declaration. No, you can't do that. There's actually a fine for that. 
No, there aren't fines for many things, but that's one thing you get fined for, $5,000. So don't do that. Only corporations can have that. Okay. Let's talk about who's involved in a corporation. So your corporation is not you. Now you've created this new child off to the side. It's called a corporation. It's a company. A corporation gets a certificate. It has its own tax rates. It has its own business number. It has it signs contracts in its own name. So if you're signing leases and things like that, you are not putting your personal name on the lease. The corporation is on the lease. It's treated like a person. Even at the bank, the corporation is a person. This thing lives on without you. So if you're hit, as my, as my business mentor used to say, if you're hit by a bus, you better have a plan for it because it carries on without you. Whether you're alive or not, it's an asset. It's part of your estate. So you need to now think about what happens if something goes wrong. You, you need people involved in this thing and you need to understand that it carries on without you and it has a lot of different things it can do, but it's not going to die with you. Your trade name will die with you. That stuff will die with you. Your corporation is a person and it lives on without you. So in order for it to function, it needs people involved. If you are the only person involved in your corporation, you're going to be all three of these things. You're going to be the director, you're going to be the officer, and you're going to be the shareholder in your corporation. Those are the three roles you're going to play in your corporation. If there are many people involved in your corporation, some of those people might be directors and officers, or they might only be directors, or they might only be officers. Some people might only be shareholders and not officers or directors. Though, so in this case, you need to understand all of these roles are separate and they all have separate roles and responsibilities and things that happen. So directors are the legal guardians of the corporation. There's regulations around directors. And if you go to that Alberta King's printer and you look at the Alberta Business Corporations Act, you'll see all sorts of regulations about directors. So in Alberta, directors must be people. They can't be other companies. They must be individuals who are 18 years or older and not in the status of bankrupt. Those are the people who can be directors. Children cannot be directors of the corporation. You have to be 18 and up. You are taking legal responsibility to be in charge of this new baby you just had called a corporation. So you will be the person whose signature is the authorized signature on the corporation in your small private corporation in Alberta. The directors are the people who are responsible and have liability associated with them in a corporation. So if the corporation fails to remit its WCB or its payroll, or if the corporation has signed contracts, you'll note at the bank if you sign contracts and your corporation signed it, your bank's also going to ask you to make a personal loan guarantee as the director of the corporation. That's so that if your corporation doesn't pay the loan back, you're on the hook. Okay, so directors have that responsibility. Directors in Alberta, we recently changed that, do not have to be residents of Alberta. You can reside anywhere in the world. You don't even have to be a resident Canadian anymore in Alberta to be a director. Some jurisdictions still require residency for Canadians, others don't. Alberta and Ontario are two jurisdictions where you no longer have to be a resident Canadian to be a director. So legal guardians are the directors. Liability, you're on the hook. This is you in charge. Officers, if it's just you involved in your corporation, you're going to definitely be the director. <coughs> Corporations will die if they don't have a director associated with it. So if you remove yourself as director with corporate registry and you file some kind of notice to change a director and you don't appoint a new person to be a director, the strike off procedure will start to begin on your corporation because it's an absolute requirement that a corporation has a director. Okay. Officers are the management team, the CEOs, the CTOs, the presidents, the vice presidents, you'll also be that. 
even though we don't register that information with corporate registry, when we incorporate you behind the scenes in your corporate minute book, and when we set up your corporate minute book for you, we appoint you as some sort of officer in your corporation. That's a management role, daily management of the business. You'll be signing bank documents in lieu of directors not being there all the time, that sort of thing. Okay. Officers have responsibility. So if the company is negligent, does something criminal, negligent, officers are on the hook for that. But officers aren't necessarily on the hook for all sorts of other stuff. So you can be an officer, not a director, and, and sort of limit that. But in a one-person company, you're going to be all of these things, no matter what you try. Okay. Shareholders are the investors. They are the people who have ownership stake in the business. They own a portion of the corporation. And the way they own a piece of the corporation is to purchase a share in the corporation. So that's what shareholders are. Shareholders can have, um, let's go there next. Oops. This is a sensitive, oh, come on. I can't get to this slide for whatever reason. It doesn't want me to stop there. Shares are a portion of ownership. When you purchase shares in a corporation, you become an investor. This is an investment tool. So you have to remember that about a corporation is its investment into the company. So you can have common shares and you can have preferred shares. Those are the two types of shares available in a corporation. And those shares in both cases can be voting shares or non-voting shares. Okay. So voting shares mean that every year, whether you're a one-person company or a 20-person company, <laughs> every year at your annual general shareholders meeting, you sit down and you review what's gone on in the business because the directors are there too, or they've reported to you and you say, yes, I approve of the financials. Or, and yes, I approve to reelect this director to their position. Voting shareholders vote to reelect directors. So when you create a corporation and you're setting it up and maybe you've got family members and maybe you've got friends and maybe you have investors and everything else, you have to sort of shuffle around who's going to do what here. So you know that the directors are the people who are in charge and liable for stuff. You know that officers are the people who may be held accountable if there's negligence, but for the most part, they're just running the daily business. And you know that shareholders are investors. And when you invest and purchase shares, whether it's in your own corporation or you're doing it in Canadian in Canadian corporations, elsewhere, whatever that may be, when you're doing that, you are giving yourself a tax vehicle. So if a company is profitable, only if it's profitable can it issue dividends on common shares. So if it's profitable and you wish to withdraw money out of the corporation, Maybe your corporation files its tax return and pays taxes because it's profitable and, and pays taxes at a lower rate than a person does. And maybe it also issues out dividends to the shareholders saying, hey, we were profitable this year. You're going to get dividends and dividends are taxed at a lower rate than salary. So when you have a corporation, it's important to know what roles you're going to be playing in it and who might be playing roles in the corporation with family, maybe they're only non-voting shareholders because you don't want your kids re-electing you as director each year, or however you may have set that up. And you want to understand that the shareholders are the real key piece of the puzzle because the shareholders are the people who get all the tax benefits. They uh, have the voting rights to re-elect the directors if they've got voting rights, so on and so forth. So when we create your corporation at my office, we make sure that we give you a big treasury of unlimited numbers of shares that we build into your articles of incorporation and they are in unlimited amounts so that the treasury just goes on and on and on forever. And so that at some point in the company, when you wish to purchase the actual shares, you just open the door to that treasury and say, oh, 
I want a hundred of those A common voting shares for me. That's the shares I'm going to purchase in the company and I'm going to buy them for 10 cents each or a dollar each. You set the price. But when we actually structure the company and set it up and register it, we make sure that it's structured so that you have varieties and unlimited numbers of different types of shares so that this corporation can grow over time and bring in shareholders over time. You are limited under the Business Corporations Act to being a private company. You can't just issue out your shares willy-nilly to the public. It's got to be friends and family. There's lots of regulations about keeping it as a small private company. Because the second you start to say, oh, I've got a corporation and I'm going to issue shares to the world and sell them, and you're doing it on a level like that, you become subject back to Alberta King's printer to the Securities Act. That's for publicly held companies. And there's all kinds of regulations about who can and can't have shares and how you can sell them and reporting and auditing. And it's nasty, nasty stuff. So you're always going to maintain yourself as a small uh, private corporation. I know we had someone in here who was talking about tech companies and being in the tech world. If you're creating a tech company, you can start it out as a very basic, small, uh, small structured uh, entity, opening up the door with your articles of incorporation to have lots of available shares. But ultimately, when you get to the point where you're bringing in large investors into your corporation and you're doing it maybe as a tech company looking for that big volume of investment, you're going to be sitting in the law office reorganizing the corporation at that point and also amending the articles to bring in all sorts of series of shares and things like that. It becomes a process you do through the lawyers involved because when you're getting that kind of money into the company, you're paying the lawyers to do that work for you. So uh, that was maybe a little bit of what we needed to get to with shares. Okay. Any questions? on shares and shareholders and the people involved in the company. Ah, shareholders, children can be shareholders in a corporation and other corporations can be shareholders in a corporation. There used to be many, many benefits to having children as shareholders in a corporation, but the CRA rules around that have changed drastically over the years. So if you're thinking about bringing in uh, children as shareholders in a corporation, talk to your accountant, whether or not that's viable or, or doable or, or worth it. Can there be multiple directors? Okay. Yes, there can be multiple directors as long as you set that up when you incorporated it. So if you walked into the registry or did whatever you did and created your articles of incorporation and built that into the, those articles on that form saying we can have a minimum of one and a maximum of 15 directors, then you can have up to 15 directors of your company. If you've said, I can only have one director, then you're only allowed one director. If you walked in and said, oh, we want two directors only, then you can't have less than two and you can't have more than two. So if you're going to incorporate, make sure you give yourself a minimum and a maximum. Usually one to seven or one to 15 is fine. And then you can have lots of directors of the corporation. But remember, directors have their meetings where they make business decisions. Shareholders have their meetings and shareholders are the people who elect the directors. You can appoint directors between meetings, but share voting shareholders elect the director. If uh, if the com if you pass away and your company lives on with you, the company is considered an asset. It's one of your property assets. So under back to King's printer, under the acts of Alberta that talk about what happens when you pass away, this asset passes along if you haven't updated your will or estate planning or anything else to whoever is next in line and they get shares. Okay, so your shares go to those people, shareholders. That's why shareholders are important. Uh, so one of the things you want to do when you create a corporation is make sure you understand what's going to happen to this thing when I die. What do I want to see happen here? If you have multiple shareholders from multiple families because you're in business maybe with a friend, 
and the two of you have started this corporation, then what you really want to do is make sure you have something called a shareholders agreement. They're not expensive. You know, a small boutique law firm will prep that for under $500 for you. Talking about what to do if someone wants out of the company and wants to get rid of their shares, uh, how you would set pricing on that. And then they would also talk about what's going to happen if one of you passes away, because if you're both shareholders, then that other person, their shares pass on to family members. So you can find yourself in business with your former partner's family members. And maybe you don't want to be in, in business with the other person's wife. That's what will happen there. So be aware that shareholders are important for that reason. Okay. Anyone else got anything in chat? You're all seeing my, is everyone still seeing my screen? Can you see record keeping here? Good. Okay. So we keep records with corporations doing something called minute books or corporate record books. In the olden days, you used to get these lovely fancy leather binders with all this fancy paperwork in it and all these beautiful share certificates. Uh, my company, we've been running that as a digital application for the last 15 years. So uh, that binder or that virtual binder, however it comes to you or whatever you do with it, is where you keep the company records. So your certificate of incorporation goes in there, your registration statement, your articles with your schedules, how you set up the corporation. Uh, when you create the corporation, you hold your first set of meeting minutes with shareholders and directors and the shareholders agree to take up shares and pay for them for a certain price. And then the certificates are issued to those people and it's all kept in a nice tidy binder of some sort. Um, at my office, we do it as a digital binder and we hold it all for you. So it's all done for year one. What that does is it gets you down the path of accurate record keeping because at some point in time, CRA might want to see who are shareholders. We need to get a, a record of this. In some provinces, they're very sticky about who are directors and shareholders and things like that. And they want those record books kept up to date and banks even ask for them. So it keeps all the internal company record keeping in one place. It allows you to show your accountants, the CRA if they ask for it, or anyone else who asks for it, it's public, uh, to see what's going on here and make sure the shares and everything are the way they are. Um, if you're keeping track of shares being transferred throughout the years, directors coming and going, things like that, if your company grows to a size where you want to sell it, the buyer is going to want to see this stuff and they're going to want to see the track record. So that's what record keeping is uh, for your business every year. It's filing that annual return that goes into the record book, any kind of meetings you had to issue dividends to shareholders, any kind of meetings you had to remove directors. So remember, if you want to remove directors, the shareholders have to vote on that, uh, things like that. Uh, remove other, removing it. Okay, so all that record keeping goes on. Okay, so you can, directors can resign, directors can be voted out by sh voting shareholders. You can, you can certainly choose to walk into a registry and say, I'm gonna re I'm removing this director as of such and such a date. But if you didn't do it following a formal process properly in your corporation, and if that person ever wants to disagree with you about what's going on with the corporation and you didn't formally hold the shareholders meeting or they didn't formally sign the resignation papers or you didn't formally do that, then they're welcome to walk into the registry somewhere else and say, oh, please add me as director to this because it looks like I was taken off without my knowledge and without my approval and we'll add that director back on. So you wanna follow some formal procedures to make sure shareholders and directors and officers come and go properly. You don't do this stuff behind their back. I'll just be blunt about that. You don't do it behind their back. You don't wanna end up in the, with civil litigation for years because you did something in five minutes in anger or behind someone's back. You wanna do it properly following following formal procedures. 
if you want to close a business, you need to ensure that taxes have been clean. So if you want to just plain out dissolve a corporation because you're done with it, uh, there's a process called articles of dissolution and you make sure you have no assets or liabilities. You make sure anything's been cleaned up in the corporation. Nothing's held in its name. Taxes have been filed. You make that declaration on a sheet of paper and you can file that with a, a registry, but check in with your accountant first, make sure you've cleaned up all the liabilities, taxes have been cleared, everything's done and you can now just dissolve the corporation. Yes, you can do that if you want to dissolve it. Okay, can there be multiple directors? We've answered that. Yes, you can have lots of uh, directors and directors can be appointed to be directors between annual general meetings, if you've written that into your articles, but every year that has to be approved by the voting shareholders. If you're running your corporation alone, what do you put into meeting minutes? Basically, you, you don't have minutes per se, you have resolutions. We resolve that we have reviewed the financial statements and approve of those. So you approve of your financial statements. We resolve that we approve of the re-election of me, myself and I as director again this year and that there's no other business. You may throughout the year have to make resolutions about transferring shares. If you're transferring shares, the directors are responsible for resolving those things. So even if you're a one person, even if you own a corporation as a shareholder and you're also the director and officer and those are the only things you are, you're actually holding those annual meetings every year. Yeah, you don't record everything in your record keeping. So you don't record the fact that today we bought the blah, blah and did that. What you're reporting is reviews of financial statements, issuance of dividends, transfers of shares, things that belong in those categories, but you're not having meeting, you're not reporting meeting minutes there over, you know, we decided to buy a vehicle today and needed a director's resolution because it's in the company name. Those sorts of things fall under the category of everyday business that don't require meetings. So just to be kind of clear on that. Okay. So step one is to figure out the registration. You're going to have provincially sole proprietor partnership corporation. Once you have that, that's when you go and obtain the licenses you're supposed to get. So don't get a municipal license in your personal name, then create a corporation and have to do the whole process all over again because then you need to get the municipal license and corporate name. So you may, may not be required to have a municipal license for the type of business you run. Who do you check with? The city or the town or the locale you're in to see whether or not it's even required. If it's a virtual home-based business online and you're just setting up shop in a little section of your basement somewhere doing this virtually, there's no requirement, probably nine times out of 10 for you to have a municipal license. Usually the municipality wants to know you're running a home-based business when you're doing things like, maybe you've got a workout class coming to your front yard every other day of the week and there's traffic in your neighborhood from it and there's people coming and going from your home or there's logistics involved, yeah, you're probably gonna need that municipal license. Or if you're in a type of business that requires totally requires a municipal license. For example, some kind of food restaurant business, uh, something that sells liquor, uh, those licenses are required. If you're running an escort agency in Calgary, you're required to have an escort agency license. All kinds of uh, types of businesses that are required to have city licenses and other businesses, it's an option. Be aware of that. You may or may not wish to apply for WCB, there's all kinds of reasons you may or may not want to do that. That's your decision. You figure that out by contacting WCB and saying, well, I'm on job sites. The people, uh, the people who are you know, managing the job site want my, my private contracting firm to have WCB because I'm on a job site with these people. Maybe that's why. Um, if you're running your home-based business out of the office, WCB may not apply to you. Uh, you know, there's better uh, insurance uh, options for you than WCB. 
If you are a doctor, a lawyer, a chiropractor, an optometrist, someone like that, you'll be uh, a CPA, you'll be paying professional fees and registering your professional corporation with your governing body. Professional corporation, so if you see Prof Corp or professional corporation on the end, is reserved for about six or seven types of professions in Alberta. Most professions don't qualify for professional corp status. Uh, if you are involved in door-to-door -door sales, if you're involved in those types of things, you may be subject to regulatory compliance from Alberta Consumer Affairs. Uh, so check on those, uh, check with them. Do you need to have a special license for that? Uh, that would be that. Okay. I'm going to open up all, uh, the rest of the session for questions. And I'm going to try to dump a few links in uh, while I do it. So I have paused my screen sharing. And I'm going to go in and see if I can dump a few links uh, for everyone into, uh, into chat while I wait for questions. So first thing I'm going to drop for you is going to be all about keeping good records copy that and I'll put it into chat. And if you have questions, you could start to put them into Q&A as well. And I'll check on that momentarily as well. Let's see if we got any more. Ah, I have some municipal licensing and consumer affairs licensing links to uh, put in for you as well into chat as well. I'm a professional consultant based in Calgary. I have some forthcoming clients okay across the country. Uh, if you are operating your business from a Location here in Alberta and everything you're doing is on your phone, email, online, etc. Register your corporation here uh, uh, and do that. If you are setting up an office, for example, oh, you're uh, an immigration consulting company maybe, and you are setting up physical offices in spaces across the land, then yes, you will have to extra provincially register your company in those jurisdictions. I will not be giving away a copy of the presentation today, but I will be sending a follow-up email with a survey asking you how I did today, along with a resource booklet of links. And then the recording of this particular webinar is going to go up onto the Business Link website in a couple of days as well. So I'll make sure that that goes out uh, to everyone. Uh, do we have to have WCB if we have employees? Check with WCB. Some businesses, yes. Some businesses, no. So it depends on your industry. Check with WCB if you have employees, if you are in an industry that's required to have WCB. So Mystic, hopefully that answered that question. Uh, we've got multiple directors answered. Children. Children are not operating a business, but they can certainly be shareholders in a corporation and your accountant will let you know if that makes tax sense. Uh, I have a business number of CRA, but not registered with Alberta. Do I still mm. need to register with Alberta? Um, Check with CRA, what's that business number attached to? Is it attached to your personal name or is it attached to some trade name that you gave them? I am not sure, Amanda, so you may want to check on that. Okay, let's see if we've got... Excellent, excellent. Okay, so if you want to reach out to me and just talk a little bit about anything you may not have understood today or, or need just a little bit more info, I'm going to send you my email address in chat. Uh, and then I am in the next couple of days. So expect an email uh, probably before Friday with a link to the recording, a survey, and a, a follow-up resource booklet uh, to this as well.
Okay, everyone, I just want to say thank you uh, for coming today. I really appreciate you staying on and listening to me and asking lots of great questions. I really appreciate that. I will stop the recording and hang in another minute or two after that to answer any remaining questions.